Welcome back to Dial H for Hair Clicks. This is episode 260. I'm your host, Chris Britton. Let's go. Dial H for Hero Clicks is brought to you by CoolStuffInc.com, where you can find cool stuff in stock every day, including all of your latest Hero Clicks singles and sealed products. So don't forget to check them out at CoolStuffInc.com. And still remember, you can use code DIAL5 at checkout for 5% off of your order. Uh, Calder is not with us this week. He is off on adventures, and I'm sure we will talk about that. On next week's episode, but I'm very genuinely excited to have someone on the podcast this week that you guys have heard his name a million times, jumping on in our community section, and quite honestly, one of the greatest purveyors of answers out there in our community section, and that is none other than Collectible. Welcome to the podcast, man. Well, thank you. Uh, filling in for call to this week, um, I don't know that I want to steal his catchphrase, but I'll say, hello, hello. Let's get excited. <laughs> so we should say you do actually have your heroic title. Title, You are a vigilante uh, in the Dial H community, so we do appreciate that. But uh, even though people have heard your name about a million times, they haven't really gotten to know you um, other than the answers in the community, what they've been able to parse out of there. So let's start off like we typically do when we have somebody brought onto the podcast for the first time with an interview. Okay, so how and when did you get into the game of Heroclix? Well, my first exposure was back in 2002, believe it or not. Um, actually, I had a friend at the time who saw an ad for the game and went to his friendly local gaming shop and said, uh, that Heroclix thing looks kind of neat. Um, if you get any, I'd like to get a box. So the owner said, sure, why not? And a month or three later, when it arrived, he got a phone call. You know, your box is here. Please come pick it up. Uh, my friend had asked for basically one box or the equivalent of whatever one booster was back then, which was something like three pieces. When he got there, he realized the owner had ordered him basically an entire case, which meant that <laughs> okay. more than he wanted. But, you know, he didn't want to stiff the owner. Um, so he definitely offered me a few, you know, just free pieces like I've got three of everything here, just take a few of these. And um, it was it was fun, but it was also back then really clunky. Like you just didn't have as much move and attack back then. So it was literally move, rest, move, rest, park next to someone, rest, attack, miss, you know, and it was neat, but it, it wasn't really refined yet or they didn't really, it, the game wasn't quite there yet early on. Um, so I played a few times and would buy like the occasional pieces, but didn't really play very much at all or even take the game seriously until years later i think part of the issue was that every so often i'd see something for sale and the the box art would really kind of catch my eye so for example i saw a, a web of spider-man booster and i thought oh cool spider-man i might get uh, the sandman or doc ock or something like that and i bought the booster and opened it and it was like the burglar J. jonah jameson and will the wisp and i went oh and that I would just kind of do that every so often and go, ooh, wow, look, Hero Clicks, that looks neat. And look at the box art and open it up. And it's, you know, Joe Schmo number three, who's got, you know, awful numbers. And that it would just, it would go into a little storage tub somewhere and kind of go away. Um, and eventually the set that got me into playing was Deadpool, just because um, I, I wanted to find like a local group of like a gaming kind of thing locally to do. And I remembered, ooh, Hero Clicks. And just, decided to kind of stat, take a stab at playing it, and I saw the previews and bought a bunch of, you know, boosters. And that was before I knew what buying a sealed brick was and, and that sort of thing. Um, but I found a pretty good community in northern Virginia. And um, from Deadpool until about, like, two years ago, I basically went out and played weekly um, and would try to do the occasional um, event or convention or what have you. And the game has changed quite a bit, and I probably wish I'd been more choosy with what I um, – you know, bought in bulk, but overall it's, it's been a pretty amazing game. Okay. So back in, you said 2002, that's when you started. Um, Absolutely. what were some of the pieces that stood out to you right when you started, like from the old days, some of the, the listeners now won't even, won't even know what some of these are, but some of the older guys out there like myself, 
Totally no. So for the nostalgic feels, what were you what were you playing against or what were you playing with or looking at at least? You want to hear the good ones or the bad ones? The ones that stood out to you. The ones that really stood out to me, I think the the original, I think old timey abomination, if that rings a bell. I just yeah. thought he looked um and he wasn't really much of a slouch either. I think the sculpt looked neat, but it was very simple and straightforward. Um I think the old Brainiac, that looked pretty neat. The, the pegs and the flight bases were really super clunky, but it, it, they were still new at it. Um, and a lot of the pieces like like Hobgoblin, like little stuff, like I never really thought I'd see something like Hobgoblin in tiny little plastic. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was pretty thrilled about that. The, the bad part was you would open a booster and you get stuff that – on paper was really powerful, like the old Thor or the old uh, thing. But there were so many pieces with these big, goofy, googly eyes. Oh, it, it, yeah, they looked so derpy back in the day, back before they were – did you ever find out, were those hand-painted back then, or was that just like a really bad machine? You know, I think they had to be all hand-sculpted or hand-painted or what have you because, number one, they had the – didn't they have like the Chase like masterpiece – like? sculptor autograph pieces or something that you could find randomly is that the one okay so i remember at some point there were those do you remember the purple ringed ones they were like a masterpiece i thought there was like a masterpiece version i remember there was a loki that was made and it ended up being like a crazy expensive piece but i don't remember like when that time period i don't know what else was going on there was just some weird stuff going on in the game of hero Flicks back then I want to say there was a, a Magneto like that. And I, 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 I just don't remember if it was you're getting an autograph by the sculptor or what it was. But it, it just – it was just so hit or miss back then. You had basically something that looked amazing or something that looked like a five-year-old made it. And oh, that's there... really true. That's really true, though, because, <laughs> like, I, I loved uh, – do you remember the first Thor that was ever made? Now that, oh. that sculptor was like ripped directly from the comics, where he's got the the hammer up in the air, but it, his back leg is like pointing off, and he's got that flowing cape and stuff, and it looks like he's calling down the lightning. I was like, man, I love this sculpt. Back then, that was a pretty good sculpt, I thought. But then there was also stuff like, do you remember Puppet Master? Oh yeah, <laughs> so bad. So. But then every often you've got some older pieces that just look. Even if they're not completely serious, they look amazing today. Like Mr. Mind is still one of my favorite looking pieces. It's just it's a little cartoon bug in a jar, but it was done so well. And like the I think Mirror Master was literally a sticker on just a piece of flat plastic, but it was it, it was just creative and it looked good. Oh, speaking of just an awesome old sculpt, do you remember Plastic Man but as a mailbox? As a matter of fact, I never actually got one. Uh, but about a year or two ago, I just went ahead and bought one on eBay because I realized that a red uh, Plastic Man mailbox was a perfect heavy object. <laughs> Did you rip I, it off the base? Oh, no, I leave them on the base, but I have one of those. They used to have those um, ID rings in different colors you could put on the old-time Heroclix. They don't fit on the Oreo bases, but you could use, that, use those on the old pieces. So I got some of the red ID rings. And I put that on Plastic Man, so it's very clear he's a heavy object. That's awesome. Uh, absolutely, completely unusable by today's standards, but still, yep. that sculpt is on point. <laughs> they, they did a good job. I still have the hang glider Plastic Man that I've never actually played, and I'm pretty sure I never will, but it still looks neat. But it, it fits that it was goofy and it needed to be fun. At this point, do you want to play hang glider Plastic Man, or do you just want to play Kite Man Hell Yeah? Well, technically, you could do both. <laughs> Make an entire team of kites. Let me know how that <laughs> – all two of your options, I think. Are there any other kites in the game of Hero Clicks? I don't think so, but that will be a nice 15-minute game. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. All right. Well, those are some of the older pieces. Uh, what stands out to you uh, in more modern times, pieces that people might actually – Remember, if you're a newer player, um, as some of your favorite pieces or combos of pieces that you've played with over the last few years? Well, to be quite honest, I think the week, one week ago, or maybe two weeks ago, you and Calder were talking about um, some of the worst sculpts. And I think Calder may have mentioned Super Saber, which I was kind of hurt by, because I love Freedom Force. <laughs> that, okay, so full disclosure, that was me. <laughs> He just so, looks so bad. I mean, like, he's a decent decent click, uh, 
but tell me why you love Super Saber. It's it's just one of those really obscure eighties X Men villain characters that you really didn't think you'd ever see in Heroclix. And he ended up being really, really good in Heroclix form. He's cheap. He's effective. He works very well as part of a team. And to be fair, I mean, there's not really a whole lot you can do with a super fast old man wearing a, a cheap Halloween costume. So I think the sculpt is really all that it could be. And you really want to save your really dynamic sculpts for, you know, chases and super rares anyway. For sure. For sure. So other than uh, him, what else you've been playing with? Um, one of my favorite combos actually is, uh, I think Jakar is a fantastic piece. I like playing him at 75 points. And what I'll do is kind of match him up with the Grandmaster that forces two pieces to fight. And so I'll kind of use Jakar to position my opponent's pieces and mine, and then kind of have Grandmaster sit back, pit people against each other, and then use his prob to make sure things go the way uh, I want them to turn out. Um, usually the best attacker to kind of fill in and kind of do all that damage is the super rare Michelangelo that has the built-in, I think, toughness, combat reflexes, and some prob. Oh, yeah, so, the, the IDW one? I believe so. I can check real quick on... Is it the one with the uh, nunchucks in the cool pattern? Like, he's, like, spinning them around? Pretty sure that's the one you're talking about, right? It is. But he's got so much built in. He's 100 points, but he's absolutely worth it. So between Michelangelo's prob and Grandmaster's prob, I, I mean, you're just going to have so much going your way. And remember, too, that Jakar kind of throws in that, that ding when he can TK people. Right. Between those three, I mean, you can really just, you know, manipulate the map. I'm hearing a lot of probability control on your teams. Do you have bad luck like I do? It's not that I have such bad luck, but everyone else kind of just has their own select um, magical dice. And it's it's really rare that you see other people roll poorly consistently. So it's just as much as getting protection for yourself, you have to kind of uh, account for other people having really good luck or just really hot dice. Sure. Okay. All right. Well, uh, are you typically going to be more of a meta player or a casual player then? Uh, 100% absolutely casual. I did meta for about two weeks during the Age of Ultron. <laughs> okay. I mean, I did okay, and I actually do fairly well in Sealed. But just when you live and die with every die throw, it, it just it doesn't become fun anymore. And I, I found myself um, clonking my head against the, the table a lot. And I, I hope I never came off as a poor sport because I, I don't think I was, but I don't want to feel like, you know, I took losses badly. But once I felt like I was kind of just going Ugh, with every miss, I just I wasn't having fun. So I just kind of went, you know what, I'm not going to I'm not going to play that scene. I'm just going to have fun and show up and try to get other people to enjoy the game and, and have a good time. That's that's fun for me. I like playing theme accurate or doing, you know, interesting custom scenarios. So casual 100 percent. Okay, so when you're talking about custom uh, games, which yeah. formats are your most favorite when you're when you're doing casual stuff? Well, to be quite honest, I think we we kind of gravitate towards just friendly battle royales. Um, I think any HeroClix player knows that you're going to collect way more pieces than you're ever going to play, and so I think a lot of our battle royals are: I have this mountain of stuff I want to play. Let me find 300 points, and I'll throw that on the map. And then we'll just go for an hour, put them all away, pick a new team, play for another hour. Okay. Uh, besides that, we kind of try to come up with something interesting now and then. Um, we came up with a custom scenario with cameramen. Um, so we came up with these little pogs, and I found someone on Facebook that does um, custom pogs. So you have to carry a cameraman at no cost to your team, and they have a certain, you know, range, and they have their own powers and abilities and that kind of thing. Um, but any kills you make don't count unless the cameraman sees it or catches it on camera. That's an extremely interesting format that I've never heard of before. You guys just come up with that? Yeah, we just kind of made up uh, a scenario and ran with it. And every so often we do something fun to make it more complex, like um, characters on your team with the celebrity keyword uh, get to use shape change for free. We did that once, and the game took forever, so we're – Probably not going to do that again, but it's <laughs> okay. Okay. The the pogs made, so we try to introduce new wrinkles and kind of get more use out of those pogs. Okay. No. So if someone were out there were like, man, I really want to play with collectible. 
Uh, where are they going to find you? Where's your typical venue? Well, I'm lucky enough to live in an area that has many venues nearby. Uh, I live in Northern Virginia. I typically play at Victory Comics in Falls Church, Virginia, uh, but we're surrounded by several venues. And in fact, um, there is Comics and Gaming Fairfax, which has a former world champion um, as a regular. He's the one that appears on the sculpt with Stargirl. Okay, cool. Oh, man, I was just uh, kind of crapping on that sculpt like two weeks ago. Oops. <laughs> Don't tell him uh, I said anything. <laughs> I'm sure he's heard it, and I think being immortalized in plastic, I think he's okay with it. Yeah, I mean, I can't say that I am immortalized in, in plastic, and at this point, even if I did win Worlds, I'm pretty sure WizKids would just go, yeah, that's cute. We're not going to let you make one, Chris. We know what you say about us. <laughs> so at least he's got that going for him for sure. So, all right. If anybody out there wants to play with Collectible, you know where to go and play with him at. Uh, we have a bunch, uh, maybe moderate, we'll say moderate amount of news to get through. So let's jump into the news section. All right, we did actually get an article this year from WizKids. Uh, it is the National and World Championship update for 2019. Uh, read through that real quick in case that does actually affect anybody out there. It says, greetings, WizKids fans. WizKids is excited to announce that this year's World Championship event will be in Memphis, Tennessee on Friday, September 6th through Sunday, September 8th. We will follow up with venue, room block reservations, and hotel locations once that information becomes available, so stay tuned. While we, know, we may not have all the details squared away at this moment, we know how important it is to provide as much notice as possible for players to make the necessary arrangements to attend our event. Players will have the opportunity to compete in four different world championships, including Heroclix World Championship, Heroclix Team World Championship, Dice Masters World Championship, and Star Trek Attack Wing World Championship. Between the premier events and numerous side events, there will be plenty of opportunity to walk away with convention-exclusive prizes and to be able to purchase many for the sale promos, convention exclusives, that will be available. Uh, by the way, we will go through. We got actually get the dollar amounts on a lot of those, and we'll go through those in a minute just to give you a heads up on what you're going to be spending if you buy them. To finish out this article, it says, Players can earn their World Championship qualification by competing in our National Championship events. Friendly reminder that the first National Championship will be at Origins Game Fair from June 12th through June 16th in Columbus, Ohio. If you plan on attending, please make sure to pre-register to let us know you will be there and make each event run smoothly and efficiently. Once again, stay tuned for more information about your World Championship event. Until then, may all your dice be... May all your dice be in your favor. Hmm, okay. Is that a thing now? <laughs> Did they say at the end of uh, articles? Maybe? I, it better than nothing. All right. Um, so, multiple things here real quick. Uh, if you are going to Origins, Calder and I are going to old Origins, and we're, I think we're trying to set up an outside of Origins meetup so if you are interested in doing that, at least to go out for lunch or dinner one of the multiple nights or playing Heroclix probably what will end up being in like our hotel room, just like casual games for fun and hanging out or anything like that, please let us know uh, in advance and we can totally make plans to hang out with you. Um, in any way, shape, or form, do you think that this collectible will affect the players in your area? I mean, Memphis is going to be a longer drive, and I think a lot of people really enjoyed Philadelphia last year, and I think there was just kind of like a, an assumption that WizKids would go back to the same place because it, it really did go so well, and Philadelphia is kind of accessible to a lot of areas. Um, I'm sure there are people close to Memphis that are thrilled by this news, but just I would think you'd like to see some consistency from WizKids to have – hey, this went really great last year. Why not do that again? And I, I don't know what was wrong with last year. I don't – I mean, obviously it's not going to affect me. Hopefully it doesn't negatively affect anybody out there. I know that in the past WizKids has changed things like this after people had already 
booked hotel rooms, booked flights, and they flown – like they were planning on being there for a specific event, and then it was taken away from that um, game fair or uh, wherever – and that convention, and they were extremely upset. So I really hope that we got this information out there in case it does change people's plans, just in case. I don't want you guys wasting a bunch of money on flights for no reason. So um, we do have, just in case you are going to be buying some of the convention exclusives this year, we have the prices, like I said, so we'll re run through those real quick. Uh, the Lobo is going to be for $20.00. Avengers 1 million BC, Ghost Rider, and Mammoth Colossal is going to be $40, which is actually $10 less than what I thought it was going to be. I was a little kind of excited about that. That will be my fourth 1 million BC Avenger if we're, we're tallying them up. Magneto is going to be for $15. The Batman uh, Batmobile is going to be for $30, which is also cheaper than what I kind of thought that it was going to be by about $10. Also pretty thrilled about that because... I needed – as soon as they made the animated universe uh, Justice League, I needed them. So I had to get – I think I'm only missing like one, but man, I need that Batmobile. That is freaking awesome. And then the last one for sale is going to be Dupe, and it's going to be $20. Did any of these strike your fancy or you're just like, eh? I mean, I think for me it's just – it's neat, but I'm never really going to play any of them. Um, I think the only one I have to have is Lobo because – they really never give you Lobo. The last one we got in an actual set was Superman, right? And then the only other one we've gotten besides that is maybe the OP kit Lobo. Okay, yeah, fair enough. It's always nice when they make characters that you just – you've never seen or they just don't make very often. Or they at least do the character justice. Now, th this may be a little bit contentious out there, but the last Doomsday that they made I thought was actually a better representation representation of doomsday than they had ever made so i was like okay with the fact that it was a con exclusive fair enough okay. but again or iconic and you think you would see doomsday a little more often you would think but i mean it's not like he's that complex of a character so storyline wise out of the comics that i've read from dc side you don't really see doomsday all that often because he's not intelligent and He's just a beat stick, so you know they they reserve a lot of those characters that are more intelligent and conniving and stuff like that, and they use them in the comics a lot more often than they use characters like Doomsday. So I don't know. I expect them. They, I understand why they we, why we get a bunch of Jokers. You know what I mean? Because he's in the comics all the freaking time. Doomsday is iconic, but why is he iconic? Because he killed Superman, but that was like one time, and then I mean that was a long time ago now. That's true. It's been, I think, 25 years. So, actually, speaking of, did you see the animated uh, version of that? They made a um, Death of Superman animated movie, and then right after, as like part two, they made a Reign of Supermen movie. Did you get to see those? I didn't get to see those, and I, I kind of want to because, for the most part, everything animated done by DC turns out really, really well. Yeah, so the first one is exactly what you would suspect out of it, okay? Nothing really is different. Not really is different. They took a little bit of liberties from the comics because I actually read that. Um, the, the main difference are the Justice League members themselves because in the original run, it was like like Blue Beetle and Booster Gold, and I think it was like Fire and Ice, and there are a lot of Justice League members that not a lot of people care about compared to the ones that they replaced them in the movie with. So, like, there was Hal Jordan, Green Lantern, and Wonder Woman was right there, and Batman was there, and, you know, it was all the big names. So, I think that the movie was actually probably a better story because it had all the big name characters that you want to see. Like, a lot of people like Booster Gold, but not as many people like Booster Gold as they like Green Lantern, you know? That's true. And I, I would think that Doomsday is one of those people that you probably have to trot out every so often just to kind of keep him relevant to the game. Because as power creep kind of sets in, the most recent uh, Doomsday, even though super powerful, just kind of gets phased out by some of these, you know, really efficient 50-point pieces. Yeah, that's true. Power creep is a real thing in this game, and I've been saying it for years. So I'm <laughs> stepping away from the game. And here in a few months, I'm wondering in the future, like, when am I going to come back and how much the game will have changed between when I stepped away and when I come back, if I ever come back again. I just 
I think that'll be a really interesting thing. Um, the the second part to that was the reign of Superman, and it was the first time that I'd ever had any kind of interaction with what were the chases in a former Hero Click set, which were uh, the Eradicator and you had Steel, and it was like Superman in the black suit and. I'm glad I watched that movie because I didn't know any of these characters. It's like Cyborg Superman was in there. So, uh, are you, you're not a huge DC guy, or are you like kind of in the middle? I, I'm kind of in the. I know enough because of the cartoons and some of the really big storylines. And when it comes to stuff like uh, Cyborg Superman, that one I know a little bit more about because he got a fair amount of press in the you know the reign of the Superman. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, so. If you haven't seen those, anybody out there in podcast land, it's definitely worth watching the two just because especially if you don't know much about those characters, then you might as well go watch a movie because it's a lot easier than getting your hands on like the graphic novels and stuff. Um, and you might end up liking some of those characters. I like Steel. I didn't know that I liked Steel. I thought Steel was awesome. So made me a fan of him. All right. Moving on in the news section, we do have um, four dials that we did want to cover, three of which are the Wakandan OP kit, which turned out, spoiler alert, pretty freaking awesome. I'm not going to lie. Uh, we're going to start off with M'Baku, and he does have the Masters of Evil team ability coming in at 75 points. Keywords, Lethal Legion, which made a lot of people online happy because they're like, oh, finally they gave him Lethal Legion. Masters of Evil, Wakanda, Animal and ruler keywords. We have, let's see, one, two, four, six clicks long with improved movement, elevated, and hindering. He does have Indom, but no other special combat symbols. He starts off with charge, eight speed, ten attack with a special attack power called Strength of the Mighty White Gorilla and the Honor of a True Warrior, which gives him super strength and when Mbaku attacks, and it isn't an object attack, modify his attack by plus one. Okay, that's kind of cool. And then he's got a base 4 damage, which is naked. Um, so, you know, it's a bit of a gamble. You want the 10 attack and 6 damage? Or do you want the 11 attack and 4 damage? And then he also has a trait, which gives him uh, leadership. It's called My People Walk Alone. Leadership and Mastermind. Other characters can't you choose M'Baku for leadership or mastermind. So he's like, he's asserting his dominance right there. He's a alpha gorilla. And uh, he ha starts off with in, uh, Impervious with 18 defense. He goes down to some exactly what you would think with a close combat-oriented piece, some plasticity. And because M'Baku is M'Baku, he's get he gets uh, Battle Fury. He does get some Steel Energy for some reason. I'm not really sure how that works. And he gets combat uh, close combat expert at the end. He never drops below the ability to do at least three damage the whole dial. But six possibility on top dial, four possibility on last click. He does have uh, nine attack with steel energy, but he's got that close combat expert and sidestep. So overall, um, he's actually one of the uh, – when you're talking about just the Wakanda keyword, he's one of the heavier hitters, believe it or not, of the Wakandan keyword. And if you I, – I, di I didn't even think that that was going to be true, but I was looking through the other Wakanda figures today before we recorded, and I was like, Wow. Not a lot going on for major damage output, so it's probably better that they made him. Did you have any thoughts on Mbaku? Yeah, I think he is absolutely tremendous for 75 points. Uh, for six clicks with Indom, that is outstanding, and I think not being able to mastermind to him or uh, use leadership is a really minor drawback. And I think the Steel Energy is actually pretty accurate for him because he gets stronger the more he kind of beats up his opponent, and I think it's kind of geared towards, you know, taking the seat away from the Black Panther and kind of, you know, drawing more people to his cause as he beats his opponent. So I think that's that's pretty flavorful and pretty accurate. Um, and I think it, it's really super awesome that he gets the Wakanda keyword, and you can build a theme team around him using uh, Wakandan soldiers, troops, or what have you, as he kind of takes the Black Panther's place. Sure, sure. Okay, so that's M'Baku. I know that there's one of these pieces you wanted to talk about. Absolutely. So I want to talk about Claw, who looks tremendous. He's only 65 points, and he gets five clicks. Um, he does get the Masters of Evil's, uh, Master of Evil uh, team ability. Uh, he has a range of seven with one bolt, and keywords are aim, 
Frightful Four, Masters of Evil, and Scientist. And I, th- I was really surprised to see the Frightful Four keyword because even recent Medusa figures haven't gotten that keyword. So that was really cool to see. Um, his trait is attuned emitter frequency. So he can use empower, but only if an adjacent friendly character can use empower. Energy shield deflection, but only if an adjacent friendly character can use energy shield deflection. An enhancement, but again, only if an adjacent friendly character can use enhancement. So basically, um, he's basic, he's like a speaker to whoever he's standing next to, and he just kind of amplifies whatever they can do. So I thought that was really neat. Uh, he has a defense special on his first, second, and fifth clicks of toughness with barrier. Now he can use barrier as free, but only to generate one marker. I think that is outstanding, and that, that could see some meta play. Not that I know uh, a ton about the meta scene, but barrier for free is always super useful. Um, he does have some running shot on his first, second, and fifth clicks. Um, he has penetrating side blast on those first, second, and fifth clicks, and he has perplex on his first and third clicks. Now, for his third and fourth clicks, they're a little weird. He loses the running shot, he loses the the pen side, and he loses that defense special with toughness and barrier, and he gets phasing teleport, pulse wave, and super senses. And so I think that kind of reflects when he becomes that living sound. So he's a bit more intangible, and he's probably a little easier to hit, but he can do some really crazy stuff. So I think he's really, really useful, especially for 65 points. So when I first saw the dial, I was like, wah, wah. But then I remembered that he's 65 points, and I'm like, oh, he's actually really good for 65 points, especially for the people out there that like the Masters of Evil keyword. Um, the old one is like a super – the last one that was made was a super rare, right? So if you couldn't get your hands on that one, you might be able to get your hands on this one. And if you're not a huge claw fan, you don't want to invest a bunch of points into it. And the last one was a lot more points than this one. Then 65 points is pretty doable. The, the only thing I don't like about this is how he, he – you want him to be right next to a character so that his attuned emitter frequency trait is useful. But at the same time, if he takes a few damage, then he goes on to pulse wave – and you're not going to be using Pulse Wave right next to your people. So I don't know. How do you feel about that? Well, hopefully you've got somebody in your team that can kind of push him around and, and either carry him or TK him into position. The only thing I was disappointed by is that uh, the other claw, the one from Avengers Defenders War, um, doesn't have a lot of those things built in, which before I looked at the old claw, and I say old, it's not you know that old, um, that was a pick a power claw. And he has a fairly empty dial with a lot of stuff you can just kind of fill in. But I was kind of hoping you could build a team of all claws who kind of builds duplicates of himself, which I thought would be really neat and kind of theme accurate. But that claw is more of like you really have to fill in with pick a power. So with a little flexibility and and picking the right powers, you might be able to pull off something interesting. But that also means you have to hunt down multiples of a OP kit figure. Okay, totally fair. By the way, I just looked it up. Did you know ADW came out two years ago? Isn't that depressing? I know. Wow, it does not feel like it was that long ago, but yes, it did. But no, you bring up a really good point. Claw is definitely one of those characters that it's totally thematic if there's like multiple claws on the field. So I think that'd be actually really funny to see like three or four claws on the field all running around. Actually, uh, well, they wouldn't give each other energy shield deflection. Would this trait? work well, if the, they're right next to each other? Well, the trait says adjacent, friendly, and can use. So as long as you, one of the pickup powers you go with is ESD, they can share it. Okay, okay. Now, could it work if you're just using two of these 65 point claws right next to each other? The answer, I think, would be no, right? I honestly think if the other claw is the same figure, and it's adjacent, and it's friendly, and it has ESD, I think you, you're good to go. No, Although now that I read the text again, no, this one doesn't actually come with ESD, so no, because it would oh, have man. to. Can you? Yeah. And looking at the old claw, now I see it's um, the old claw's defense is claw can use super senses, and if he can take more than two damage, uh, he takes two damage instead. And his pick a power was to pick a standard attack power. So. Okay. Well, if there are any pieces out there that anybody knows of. Uh, specifically with the Masters of Evil keyword that you know Claw would like go really well with, write in and let us know. I'm just genuinely curious because I think that there's probably some way, somehow, 
to break this figure a little bit, but I'm just not seeing it right off the top of my head, and you guys are probably better at this than I am. Um, yep. let's, let's, let's move on to the last one, and arguably the best one of the OP kit, just because it just does some crazy shenanigans, and it really opened my eyes on some cool stuff that you can actually do with the Wakanda keyword now. I didn't I missed this before, but we'll get into it now. Queen Shuri, uh, 65 points as well. Wakanda, politician, ruler, scientist keywords. Uh, she has let's see, what's that? five clicks of life, and all five clicks she has sidestep. She is naked on attack on the first two clicks of her dial, moves on to two clicks of precision strike, and then naked for the last click of her dial. She starts off with, I believe that's 18 defense. With super senses, she does have indom, and then she starts off with a special damage power with three printed damage called Capable Diplomat, Gracious Leader, Brilliant Scientist. It gives her Outwit and Perplex, which is already great. When Queen Shuri uses Outwit, she may instead target two different opposing characters and may choose a different power for each. She can Outwit two people at once. This is awesome. <laughs> That's really good, but I was. she has a trait that makes it even better. She has traded leadership, which is awesome, and a unique modifier that says, other friendly characters with the Wakanda keyword modify speed and defense by plus one for each action token on Queen Shuri. Anywhere on the map, guys. Anywhere on the map. So even if you just want to keep her next, like, I was looking up this keyword earlier today. Remember, in the ADW set, we have a, a Black Panther. It's the one there where he's sitting on the throne. And he gives – and uh, before, the, before the show, you guys don't know this, but Collectible and I were talking about Magic the Gathering. And we were talking about, uh, if you know anything about Magic the Gathering, white weenie decks, which means like really low – uh, weak monsters that through a series of buffs you will turn them like a lot of them into really strong monsters even though they typically start off with like plus one plus ones or, or one ones as your uh, your stats which means attack and defense one and one um, you can basically do that now with uh, well I mean you could kind of do it before but this even makes it even a little bit better where with the stuff that's Wakanda is getting so many random buffs from the different characters. So the 70, not 74, that's the chase. Uh, there's another Black Panther in that set. Uh, let me see if I can find it real quick. I think that's Black number five. Yep, yeah, 58. Okay, so he's 65 points. He says friendly characters with the Wakanda keyword modify their attack values by plus one. All right, that's pretty sweet. We already knew that that was a thing, though. And then remember, I think it was Wakabi. Wakabi says... Unique modifier, friendly characters with the Wakanda keyword modify their defense by plus one. So there's that from him. With Queen Shuri, it's their defense and their speed by plus one for each action token on Queen Shuri. So really what you can do, if like you say you're just using a typical 20-point Wakandan warrior, the ones that that Black Panther actually generates, instead of looking at 7, 9, 17, 1, he can actually be... 9, 10, 8, 19, 1 with Precision Strike because and Willpower because you're going to be within 8 squares of, uh, of a friendly character named Black Panther. So I think this is kind of like a little – if you just wanted to build a small little army, fill it with 20-point Wakandan soldiers, you could do that and Precision, precision Strike just beat people down little by little like nickel dime them to death. I thought this was hilarious and – just knowing that a Wakandan warrior might have 19 defense is dumb. Like, like, um, and some of the other ones have like 18 printed defense, so it would be 20 defense. So it's going to be hard to hit them. And then um, the new Storm that came out, um, she has the thing that says if they have a Wakandan keyword and they're within three squares of her – well, it says if they have a, a friendly keyword uh, – which is, includes Wakanda, also X-Men, but they can use stealth on top of that. This is dumb. There's, like, so much, like, little synergy between the characters that you can turn these, like, little peon characters into something that can actually do 
a little bit of damage, which I thought was really funny. The only downfall is the change to leadership being a unique modifier, so you can only get plus one to your action total. I think that's what's going to kill this team. What do you think? Uh, I think you're right, and I, I wonder if it was kind of like a joke on WizKids' part that they're bringing these figures in and, and this figure specifically just as that Chase Black Panther is aging out. You th- you, th- you think it was just like a ha-ha <laughs> from WizKids? Actually, I wouldn't put that past oh, them. So much that. It may just be, well, with the last one aging out, we should probably introduce some new royalty and make sure that there are enough Wakandan pieces in modern age to kind of keep that army going. So I, I don't think it was a mistake that they're kind of making sure that you can do this weenie army for Wakanda and just kind of pump all these figures, but they don't want to have too many royal heavyweights in the picture. Yeah, that's very true, but the vast majority, like I said earlier, I mean, if you just look at the Wakanda keyword, there's not a lot of heavy hitters in there, sure. but you can seriously nickel and dime them. Um, also, there's random ones like um, the Wakandan scientist, 15 points. In power, there you go for your Mbaku, or if you park one of these right next to one of your soldiers, right, or your warriors, I'm sorry. Um, that works within three squares with that in power. There's random perplex on random uh, of these Wakanda figures. Okoye is creating random war rhinos all over the place. It's super funny, and there's a lot of leadership, and at least you can roll for them, which I think is really awesome. This is true, and looking back, you really weren't kidding. It's it's a lot of lightly armored pieces, and, and Baku is basically, I think, king of the hill, power-wise. Yeah, yeah, like, he does the most amount of damage, but maybe they're going to be focused on those, and they're not going to be focused on your three Wakandan warriors right there, that if you use, like, your three actions for the turn, and you peg them for one, one, and one, I mean, with precision strike, that'll actually do some damage. If you take three actual damage from attacks in a turn, like I think this could actually work out. So if there's anybody out there that just runs with that idea and makes a Wakandan army because of this OP kit and that Black Panther and, and Okoye, let us know how that worked out because I'm genuinely curious. I think they did a really, really good job of synergy with that with that keyword, not making any individual piece too powerful, but all of them working together is really, really cool. Yeah, the only shame is, though, that with the, the changes to leadership, you really can't go crazy and add tons of actions to your turn. You're really just kind of, you get that with a 300-point game, you get the plus one ceiling, and you're kind of stuck there. So you could just fill up the map with a bunch of people you can't move. That is true. That is true. But um, even if you can't move all of them, um, in this game, how many times has a game come down to one or two really good rolls from you? And... You have pieces like this 30-point Everett Ross that says he can use Perplex and he may modify the chosen combat value by plus two instead. So you could you could boost one of these like Wakandan warriors up to damage with that. They get Empower. I mean, you could actually – that's two plus the Empower from the Scientist is another three. You could hit for four damage with a 20-point character with Precision Strike. Also kind of dumb. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it'll be really funny, really funny. To just you like your your opponent shows up and you're like, oh, I've got they've got super doom, and you just lay out this entire army of Wakandans, and you're like, come at me, bro. <laughs> Enjoy my flunkies. Yeah, right. So really cool, really interesting OP kit. I was I was actually genuinely excited. I, I saw this comment online, and I think it's actually true. I think WizKids has actually been killing it recently with OP kits. You know, you do, there, for a while there, we were getting some OP kits that we were like, man, these are – like, I don't want any of these pieces. Or maybe you want one of them, but they're starting to make – or at least it looks like the trend is they're starting to make. Every OP kit is actually an OP kit that you might want to collect out there. I think – Do different things. Go ahead. I think that's a good call. Uh, the most recent one I think I've seen locally is the, the Spider-Man OP kit – with like the umpteenth Scarlet Spider, and I thought, it's already a character I didn't really care about, but the new previews of, with a lot of this stuff and a lot of the DC stuff that we know is coming in the near future is actually pretty neat. Uh, it's a shame, though, that I think the, the first real Martian Manhunter with the classic costume, uh, the first one we're going to be getting in a couple of years, I think, is going to be an OP kit figure. So, of course, they're going to be 
you know, 15 people going for, you know, six or seven prizes. This is very true. And if you are, if they are going to make the OP kits like more powerful, which makes them more desirable, then your secondary market is going to boost the price out there if you don't have the ability to go and play for it and you want to buy it. So good luck. Now, if we could just convince like all of the on online retailers to uh, reach out to WizKids and be like, hey, can you just sell us OP kits and then we can sell them on our websites? So, like that would be great. But unfortunately, I just don't think that's ever going to happen. I would think that if WizKids can sell the convention stuff on their website, why couldn't they do the same for OP stuff? Mm, WizKids, mm, I know that this stuff gets back to you. I do. You heard it here. You need to, you need to put the stuff out there so we can buy it. So, all right. Well, that's the OP kit. Uh, last thing we did want to talk about in the new section was we are definitely starting to get a lot more information about the upcoming X-Men sets, plural, uh, the animated set, and also Regenesis. We did get some spoiled uh, sculpts this week for the uh, Colossals for the animated set, which I'm extremely excited to talk about because I thought it was really funny. Um, we are getting a – Je uh, it's not Jean Grey. I'm sorry. It's Rachel Summers as the Phoenix with the blue Phoenix, which I thought was really cool. Um I know where that came from. I can I can find out where that came from here in a second because I actually posted about it, but it's been a while. Um, we also, in the same picture, we got a couple Sentinels. One is actually ripped directly from the animated series, which I think it was a Danger Room mission where Wolverine was in there, and this Sentinel looks like it's Cyclops on purpose because Wolverine wanted to tear up Cyclops because, you know, he hates him in the animated series. Um, I don't know what that middle sentinel is. Do you happen to have a clue on that one? I honestly don't know. It looks like there's some sort of symbol or insignia on the shoulder. So I it, saw that, yeah. I can't tell if that's a number or just like some sort of symbol, or it could be nothing, which is probably a more likely case. Um, but it, I, It's dark. It might be like a stealth uh, sentinel, right? Maybe? Could be. I, I kind of found some of the previews to be a little confusing because – I'm sure they have a lot of different colossals, but I feel like half the previews have people on, you know, Facebook or Twitter, what have you, going, "Who's the giant Iceman thing supposed to be? Who is who is that supposed to be?" And I think you should pepper your advertisement or your reveal images with most of the classic ones people are waiting for, and maybe have just one or two of the "Who is that? Oh, that's really neat. I should look into that." And I feel like most of them have been, uh, I don't know what that is. Okay, you actually bring up a really good point because this this next one. I saw it, immediately knew what it was, and then immediately backtrack and go, wait, hold on, what? We got one. Now, we knew that there was going to be a psionic version of the Shadow King. We spoiled that before we knew about that. But then we get this one that has Shadow King on it and Storm directly behind it, like it's on the same dial. And I'm like, why is Shadow King on the same dial as Storm? Because he terrorizes her in the comics. Like they're both from uh, both from Africa, and then when she was in, I think it was I think it was Egypt. That's when Shadow King discovered her, and found out that she was a mutant at about the same time that Professor Xavier found out that she was a mutant. So he's like trying to. They're both basically running and gunning for little girl Storm when she's running around the streets of Cairo. And I'm like, why are they on the same dial? She hates him. What do you do? You have any ideas? If I remember correctly, and I think I, I know the one you're talking about, it almost looks like she's being perhaps held prisoner, or maybe just sort of mind controlled. So that was kind of my guess. But it, again, it's another case of I'm not quite sure what that is. And I, until other people suggested, oh, that's that's the Shadow King, I went, oh, okay. Okay. Uh, the next one we do know absolutely for sure, and that's Mojo. Uh, we knew about that one, but the last one that we got that is a colossal. That, first of all, I totally called this Colossal Juggernaut. Now, this is Colossus as Juggernaut, and he got that power right around, was it Fear Itself? Yeah, Fear Itself. So that's very interesting, but there are primes in this set. We know that. The Colossals are going to have primes. So it's very possible we are going to get Two different juggernauts, one being Kane Marco, one being uh, Pieter, and then 
I guess you'll have one that's like basically Brotherhood of Mutants probably keyworded, and then one will just be X-Men keyworded. Uh, really cool. I think that's super crazy awesome that they made it into a Colossal. I figured that that was probably a likelihood when we got the two Hulks that we got made into Colossals. So I was like, this is the next transition for – I mean, it's it's an easy jump. What do you think? I'm one of those people that just kind of thought it was odd to have so many different sizes of characters on the same size base. So to have a Hulk kind of share the same size base with something that's supposed to be, you know, 30 stories tall didn't really make sense to me. But in the grand scheme of things, not a major gripe. And I think you are right about the primes and maybe some of the guesswork about the different colossuses or juggernauts we're going to get. So I think you're pretty spot on there. Uh, well, time will tell. That's basically what we got. Now, the Colossals were what I really wanted to talk about. They also showed that we're getting a new Bastion. They haven't made a Bastion in a really long time. If you don't know, he is a Sentinel. So my guess is they will probably return with the Sentinel keyword. If you don't remember, they made that key- keyword up. Uh, I want to say fairly recently because the old stuff, like Master Mold Colossal, does not actually have that keyword um but the newer stuff does like the days of future past ones do i suspect that they'll definitely return with that keyword um would you be crazy excited if they brought back like freedom force (laughs) as as a keyword in the set that i would i mean it to be fair it hasn't really gone away we just haven't gotten any pieces with that word Um, but i I think it's one of those pieces where you're always going to have a few people that kind of qualify and i think some popular characters from the tv show like blob and pyro uh, i would imagine will probably have both freedom force and brotherhood at least i would hope so okay yeah sure i can definitely see that that's actually another character we could get on uh colossal believe it or not would be blob i didn't even think about that until you just brought it up but it, it would be weird, but he's actually a really big dude, uh, depending on who's drawing him in the comics. Like, I've seen him be effectively, like, ungodly tall, like 15 feet tall. And I'm like, there's no way he's that tall, because in a different run, he wouldn't be. <laughs> they just change his size as they need him to be, based off of how imposing they want him to be at the time. It just so, kind of took what he had for breakfast that day. Yeah, I guess. The real question is, if they make a new blob, will he have shoes? That's what's important. That's I'm a, what I re- remember from the last blob. I'm a pro boot guy because I, I don't see any reason why he never had shoes. I know the old comic had him go without, but it just kind of seems like one of those things where eh, barefoot seems like a bad idea tactically. Mm, does he care, though? It's blob. He's like skin's impenetrable, so he probably wouldn't even feel anything. I feel like there were a couple instances where Wolverine's claws still hurt him. But oh, just- yeah. Well, adamantium can cut through virtually anything in the Marvel Universe. Yeah, and I, I, toes come off a lot easier if there are no boots to cover them up. Mm, fair enough. All right, well, that is what we got from the animated set. Uh, real quick, we have like three sculpts that were non-digital and released from the Regenesis Summer OP. Uh, and if you remember, there's going to be colored dials, uh, yellow uh, for the Wolverine side, and then there's going to be blue, I believe, for the Cyclops side. We got three sculpts. I know you and I wanted to talk about this because I think we have differing opinions, which I want to get into. But we have um, Wolverine. We saw the digital sculpt for that one. That's fine. Same. Looks looks okay. Uh, we didn't know this, but we were getting a Kitty Pride that is sunk into the ground, and she also has uh, Lockheed on her arm so this is the return of the the purple little dragon which we have not gotten since the team base and what was that gsx no which one was that would have been wolverine and the x-men wolverine and the x-men thank you uh so we haven't seen him as in it so this is his return which i find interesting and the last one which i definitely wanted to talk about is beast but this is not just any beast this is not only blue beast but this is astonishing x-men's post-secondary mutation beast where he starts looking like a lion what are your feelings on lion beast i mean i'm more of a i like beast wearing a fez and slippers and glasses (laughs) fear so this is this is not my beast i understand people that that enjoy their their hank mccoy to be a, a monkey or a bird or a frog or a chicken or whatever he might be now but he was fine. Everybody loved classic Beast that, that quoted, you know, science books and things like that. So I, the dial itself looks really tremendous, but 
because the sculpt to me is kind of just a turnoff, this is just a, this is a no go for me. It's just, he didn't need more layers of fur. He didn't need an unnecessary vest and he didn't need more fangs. So I'm just, eh, it's not for me. All right. Fair enough. So it was like the late nineties or maybe no early two thousands when I think they really truly introduced the idea of these secondary mutations. Uh, another example is, uh, White Queen, she did not originally have the ability to turn to Diamond. That was a secondary mutation when uh, the this Tri-Sentinel tried to kill all of the mutants on Genosha. Iceman ended up getting another mutation after that that allowed him to like turn his entire body solid ice all the way through, which allowed him to take like gratuitous amounts of damage and like have limbs chopped off and stuff and he could regrow them he did not have that ability before so this was just one of those things they're like what can we do with beast to like kind of spice up his character and they're like let's make him look like a lion <laughs> that was his that was his secondary mutation so um i like him because that was actually a joss whedon run i believe uh, when they when they wrote that, when Joss Whedon was the director of the Avengers 2012 movie, if you didn't know, so uh, you can see how like these cross creators like jump in and out of different mediums and like what they write and stuff. I just I really like that run of the X Men, and I thought it was pretty cool. That's probably why I like that Beast. But w weird, this is the only one that we got the dial for the Beast. We didn't get the dial for um, Kitty Pride. We already had the dial for for um wolverine um do you want to talk about beast or you just want to pass since you're not not a big fan well first of all i do want to go back really quickly if you look at the picture of the the three pieces really cl uh, closely and you look at the sculpt of kitty pride she has um lockheed on her arm or her shoulder or what have you and he's breathing fire which is awesome but then if you look really closely it looks like she has a range of zero. Oh well is that zero? Because this it's kind of a blurry picture. It, it might be an eight. It's either zero or an eight, or she does have a special speed power. We see that. That's about all we can really tell past that. She has a trait. She has um, improved movement. Maybe she has one of those special powers that gives her range. Maybe. That would be really cool because just, hey, Kitty Pride, who does her usual thing, and then, surprise, dragon. Sure, sure. But it would be okay. cool to have it be like another – you know, Red Skull with a, a Luger pistol in zero range. Just why even bother with a fantastic sculpt if it doesn't do the thing it looks like it's doing? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, somewhere, somehow, I know Calder just heard you mention that Red Skull, and he's, he just he's furrowing his brow as we speak. So um, do you want to talk about the Beast dial? Well, the Beast dial is really interesting, and hopefully you can kind of catch me up here a little bit because – We'll look at the card for the 005 piece really quickly, and it mentions something that I'm going to need you to chip in on, which is the 005.1. So the dial itself looks pretty neat, but it references basically a, a second piece or sort of an upgrade. So do you know anything about that? Yeah, so my guess is, or I think we actually confirmed this pretty much, Um the only thing that's going to happen is if you play it as a theme team that specifically is the theme team mentioned in the trait. So in this particular one, it says, I stand with Wolverine at the beginning of the game. If Beast is part of a Jean Grey school for higher learning theme team, and that is one of his keywords, obviously, replace this character card with their 005.1 character card. Uh I think it's probably just printed on the other side of the card. If you go to the second picture, it actually looks like it is a folded card. I think it's just the other side. And all it does is change the second trait on all of these. Um, you want to read that first trait? This is just the 005, and this is the one that is – if you – say so if you're going to play them on like a Defender's – theme team or an Avengers theme team, which he has both of those keywords as well as X-Men, then he would have this trait. Go ahead. So the I stand with Wolverine? At no, the, Pat, the letting the beast out. So letting the beast out is free, choose one, at wit, or battle fury, and modify beast's combat values by a plus one. Beast can use the chosen effect until your next turn. Okay, so if you use him on like an X-Men theme team, you're going to have no, – no matter what, you're going to have that trait right there. 
But if you specifically use him on a Jean Grey School for Higher Learning theme team, you basically get to flip the card over. And that letting the beast out trait gets a little bit better, probably to make up for the um, fact that you are limiting the number of pieces that you can get on a – I mean, there's only going to be a handful of these pieces with that keyword, the Jean Grey keyword. So instead of it just being um, – choose one outwit or battle fury and modify his combat values by plus one what you get is uh choose one outwit and perplex or battle fury and willpower and modify his values by plus one so he gets just a little bit better the traits get just a little bit better if you use them with those special keywords not bad. And I'm glad you clarified that because at first, reading the first trait with I Stand with Wolverine, it looks like you are forced to change that other character and you may or may not have been given that card uh, with the character. So it seems like it, on first glance, like it kind of hung the player out to dry. Yeah, I totally understand. We were t we were talking about that when they first came out. We're like, are there going to be um, – is, is Beast, for example, going to take up two different character slots in the set? or whatever in the yeah so would he be five and six we didn't really know that at the time because we couldn't read the cards very well because if you remember when the cards first came out whoever took the pictures of them it was potato quality and we couldn't read like anything so it was just like a lot of conjecture um but now it just looks like they're printed on the other side so you can just flip the cards over to the side that you need them to be on for whatever theme team you're playing them on if you're playing them on a theme team and you might get an extra little bonus. And we saw that with um, Wolverine, Cyclops, and I think Gambit as well, and maybe a couple of the other pieces. So I think they're all like that. Um, to go into the dial a little bit, th there are no other special powers, and I don't think that they – have we seen any of them with special powers, or is, is that – uh, Kitty Pride, the first one we've seen with a special power? I'm not – I can't really – no, I, I think that the, the – what was it? Gambit? Gambit probably had a special power. It's been a minute since we've had these. Yeah, just looking at the top of your dial, you can see Kitty Pride has a movement special. Yeah. Um, okay, so the Beast, though, he does have the X-Men team ability, and he is two different point values. And actually, you can play one at 70 or one at 40, which is awesome, I think, because a 40-point Avengers Beast is, like, really awesome to me. I'm not really sure why. But top dial, he does have charge with 9 speed, 10 attack with quake, 17 defense with super senses, and 3 base damage. I think that's probably a little overcosted for what you get there. Um, even factoring in that uh, special trait, what do you think? I mean, you do get, you, if you choose Battle Fury, you do get the plus 1 to all of your combat values. So you're running a 5 charge, 11 attack, 4 damage. But for 70 points, that's all you get. What do you think? I mean, this is a little at 40 points. That's just a, a little obnoxious almost. It's it's just gets it's so much for 40 points. Oh, yeah, yeah. The 70-point line, I don't think it's worth it. But the 40-point line, I actually think it's worth it. Absolutely. So uh, I guess we will see more of those. And I'm anxious to see what the Kitty Pride is just to see. More, it's more because, I mean, we just got a Kitty Pride, and she got a Prime in the last X-Men set, so she's had her day recently. What we haven't had in a really long time is Lockheed, and I really like Lockheed, especially when they kind of retconned him so he could speak English the whole time, and turns out he was like an agent of S.W.O.R.D., and you're like, what? This is so weird, but it was interesting to me, so I'm glad we're getting Lockheed back. All right, do you have anything else you want to say about the X-Men sets or anything recently in the news before we move on? Well, I think the Regenesis set is going to be one of those where I think if you miss the events at your venue and you can just kind of pick and choose those individual pieces you want later on the secondary market, I think that's going to be okay. There's going to be a lot of this out there, and you don't need to have just all the tons of doubles that I think you'll end up with. Yeah, okay, fair enough and good point. All right, well, we now uh, just to let you know, Dial H does work off of the value-for-value value model, and our goal is to entertain you guys and gals. And if you feel like we do, and we give you entertainment throughout your weeks and your your commutes and your working out and stuff like that, then uh, you can jump onto our Patreon. Let us know how much you value us the way we value you, and uh, you can get your heroic title, and we will get into those heroic titles 
in the regular community section like we normally do. So let's do that. There are dozens of us. Dozens! Every week on Facebook and on Twitter, we put a Community Tuesdays question out there for you guys to jump on and answer. And we always love the huge feedback that we get from you guys. It's, it's really pretty awesome. Uh, this week's Community Tuesdays question was, if you could make a set based off of an animated comic book inspired movie, what would you have made? Um, let's actually start here in the studio collectible. What would, what would you make? I mean, my automatic answer is going to be Incredibles, uh, but the more I think about it and thinking back how I think disappointed a lot of people were hearing that G.I. Joe was not going to get a Hero Clicks license, I think I might go back to the 80s G.I. Joe movie and just kind of pull everything out of that movie, and you could easily do uh, a five-figure booster set. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... There's actually a lot of people that have been really disappointed by that. Um, something else kind of in that same vein, WizKids released an article this week. Not, No, I'm sorry. Maybe it was a tweet that they released out. And they said that they're going to set up painting nights effectively is what they are with this new release. of. So you're getting these new miniatures, right? Since we're not getting hero clicks, but we're getting miniatures. I guess with the My Little Pony ones, we are getting unpainted miniatures. And WizKids is working with, I guess, a lot of these shops to have a program rolled out that you can show up to the shop and kind of, I guess, buy into it and start painting your My Little Pony miniatures that they're releasing. And I'm like, this sounds like a lot of work <laughs> that they were willing to put in for My Little Pony miniatures that they were not willing to put in to get us G.I. Joe and Transformer and My Little Pony Hero Clicks. What, how do you feel about that? I'm sorry, this totally derailed the community section, but I just remember that. What do you think? I mean, it's one of those things where I think part of the appeal with Hero Clicks is all the work is already done. And I know a lot of us players really aren't super skilled at, you know, things like painting and detail and patience. So <laughs> the G.I. Joe was unpainted and it was just miniature. And I, I, I kind of thought miniature for what? To put on the wall or put in the yard or... I don't know what to do with that. So the, the painting workshop sounds like a neat idea, but I'm, I'm not going to do it. So nice idea, but... Uh, uh. Why do I get the feeling that most of these miniatures out there are at people's desks at work <laughs> somewhere? You know, or like glued to their dashboard in their car. And they're going to get enjoyment from that, sure. You know, I'm not going to yuck their yum, but I want my miniatures to do something. Does it... <laughs> If that means, you know, moving across the board so that I can attack them, that seems more useful to me than just having a miniature that you can't do anything with other than look at every once in a while. Although I will say, in full disclosure, a lot of my colossals end up being that just because I like looking at how, like, they look awesome right next to me. But these are, like, little ones, too. Like, only, like, a couple inches tall, probably about the same size of a typical hero click. Yeah, and I feel like most people that might get some of those – are probably only going to buy one or two, and then that's it. And then WizKids made all these miniatures for what exactly? You know, actually thinking of that, did you ever wander into a random shop and see um, there were Godzilla miniatures in foil packs that I ran across one time in a shop? And I legitimately thought that they were hero clicks. I about started buying them, and I was like, wait, hold on, hold on. No, no, this is not – Why would why would you even want this? And I remembered that it was a thing at that shop. And then I showed up to that same exact shop like a year later, and guess what is still on the shelf? Godzilla miniature foil packs. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I could have called that a year ago. Why would people buy these if you can't even play with them? I want to say that one of the shops near us had them, and it was one of the, the really few items where they just went, we didn't sell any of this, and they shipped it back to WizKids, which I didn't know that was a thing to do. <laughs> when you, it sits there for a year and no one buys it, I guess you have the ability to go, nope. Okay. Well, if you are interested in painting, and there are quite a few of people, and I suspect some of our listeners out there that do enjoy painting miniatures, and you really love My Little Pony, I guess you can get your My Little Pony fix by signing up for WizKids' new rolled-out program of Showing up at a shop so you can paint My Little Pony 
<laughs> miniatures. God, it's so, so so weird to say out loud. Okay, let's go back to the Community Tuesdays question. Um, G.I. Joe, for you, uh, if I had to make a set based off of an animated comic book inspired movie, uh, you know, honestly, it would probably just be because it was in my, my conscious recently. I mentioned this, I think it was last episode. I watched um, the... DC animated film Justice League versus the Fatal Five. Turns out, 100%, they made the Fatal Five in the uh, game of Hero Clicks in the Legions of Super Legion of Superhero set. Uh, all five of the Fatal Five are there. However, if you add them all up, they add up to this weird point total that doesn't even make sense. It's like 884 or something like that. And I'm like. What am I going to do with 884 as a total? I Don't quote me on that number, but that's what it ended up being weird like that if you add them up. And also it was just too high of a point total. Like for five figures, for 800 and something points, that's just too much. So I think it would be really cool to get that DC animated set made. And then we all, already got some of them uh, in the Batman animated series set of the Justice League. So fill out the rest of them. There is a Jessica Cruz in there I thought would be really cool. The rest of – all of the Fatal Five, make all of them since we don't have DC animated universe versions of them. We only have the comic book universe, universe versions of them. And there were a few other characters in the movie uh, that were in there that I just think would be uh, a really cool addition to the animated version of uh, the DC universe. So that would be pretty cool. Okay, so let's um, – I guess let's go ahead and start over on Facebook. Is that cool with you, Collectible? And then we'll just – I pick and choose some of the – got a lot of answers this week, so we're just going to try and cut them down uh, to some of the ones that stood out to us um, and then wrap up for the night. So is there anything that stood out to you on Facebook that you wanted to cover that was different or kind of a joke or whatever? Absolutely. So I know Eric Caves, who has a heroic title of, and please insert the title there if you could. Super fan. Super fan Eric Caves uh, says, obviously, we have to be examining in terms of gravity feed because the movies tend to feature way less characters, which I happen to agree with. Uh, the CGI team and team movie is full of strong potential characters. I want to say Batman, Ninja, or Batman versus Team and T, but I haven't seen those yet. Now, if we want to talk anime movies, I could totally do the Dragon Ball Z movie of Cooler. This is assuming DBZ have been done at all, but it's a good amount of minor supporting characters and a reasonable array of potential villains. WizKids is leaving a lot of money on the table by not adopting anime or manga, which that, that's a whole separate licensing thing. But I think I'm going to pull out his CGI team and team movie, which introduced a really lot of neat ideas. Okay. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh... <sighs> Man, it's not like we haven't said this before and a million other people have said this before. The last Ninja Turtle set was kind of like a big letdown. They just need a redo on that on a bunch of characters that have never been made. We don't need another Fugitoid. Okay, we don't need the seventeenth Splinter that no one's gonna play. Uh, make some new characters. There's plenty of characters inside of the Team and T universe to make. To this day, I'll never understand how we got a Pizza Face. <laughs> <laughs> Super funny. Don't get me wrong. Super funny. Don't know how we got it. It makes no sense, especially when we did not get a Razar from that same universe, but whatever. Moving over to the Twitter, we do have uh, Citizen Tiamu. It's our man in Finland who said, My Hero Academia. It's specifically a superhero anime. So it's a closer comparison to traditional clicks from the world of anime. And absolutely, I, I love that show. And Jaylene loves that show, too. She actively says that as we're watching it. So, I love this show so much. It would be really cool. All right, so back over to Facebook. I'm going to grab uh, Matthew Esch. Uh, just shared a simple image of Spawn uh, from an animated show or film that I'm not familiar with, but I have a feeling that it's something you've seen before. Oh, yeah, I've definitely seen that, like, back in the 90s. I can't remember what... If, if it even had a subtitle, or was it just called Spawn or something? But it was it was pretty awesome. I remember that being cool as a kid. You know how like some of the characters were just cool as children, but you didn't understand them. Yeah, Spawn was one of those characters where he was a lot more complex than a kid my age knew to understand during the '90s. I just thought he was cool looking. And then that movie came out, and I was like, oh my man, he's such a cool character. Um, for the last time without his heroic title on Twitter is Loyal Miller before 
the heroic ceremony, which is next episode, BT Dubs. Uh, Loyal Miller said, so I think Dragon Ball Z would be good for the game. It would attract another fan base, but I feel like we'd probably get uh, Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse first. I also think that Avatar The Last Bender would not be bad. Uh, speaking of Avatar The Last Bender, I saw that there's some information coming out uh, this week about that. Did you ever see the, the anime? No, not at all. So I guess they're making a live-action version of Avatar, which is pretty legit. And um, I've only seen a few episodes of the anime. Jaylene, however, grew up on uh, The Last Airbender. She loves it so much, and she's like, oh, my God, I just can't wait for this to come out uh, as a live-action. I'm like, okay, well, we can definitely watch it together. To finish out, Loyal Miller, he says, also the animation mo movie that got me into all things nerd, uh, Princess Minoki. Mononoke. However, that is a comic based on a movie, so I didn't count it. It's just an extra credit. Also, WizKids could sell out a uh, sell out the joint of po the Pokemon craze that is resweeping the nation, and I would not complain. I don't know what he's talking about resweeping the nation. I don't think the Pokemon craze ever left. It's one of those things where it's almost made for hero clicks with just the sheer amount of stuff you could use to create a set with, but. Again, it's that kind of thing where I, I don't see WizKids and Nintendo getting on the same page as far as, you know, the rights to things and paying for this and that. So it's it's a fun idea, but we'll never see it. No, well, the Pokemon company at this point is so incredibly large that I almost guarantee you they don't even know that WizKids exists. <laughs> they they're like they're like the Beyonce of nerd companies out there and WizKids is like that third rate like rapper that no one's ever heard of except for like four people on spotify compared to uh the pokemon company like no offense but it is what it is you know yeah, it's one of those things where it, if they even had a similar idea the pokemon company has enough money to just make up whatever game they want for themselves and they just do it all in-house there would be no oh yeah 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 for sure i didn't even think about that but why would why would pokemon even waste their time. <laughs> they just be like, we'll just make our own miniatures game. That's fine. I'm like, okay, Pokemon. <laughs> All right, should I go back to Facebook? Yeah, sure. All right, so David Logan says, Batman Ninja. Uh, great opportunities for amazing sculpts and some sweet vehicle and colossal figs. That's one of those ones that I've been meaning to see, and everyone says it's it, it doesn't count for anything. It's not part of, like, any main universe or anything like that. It's just sort of like a one-off just fantasy kind of take on Batman, but done really well. And I feel like that's one of those things that would never get its own set, but you might see it as like an OP kit figure, like a Samurai Batman or Ninja Batman or whatever the case may be. Oh, that would be a good one-off. And in all actuality, I think it would be a weird uh, chase set for the future for a DC set. I think that would be cool. Um, I've seen that. I think we talked about it on the podcast a long time ago, uh, but – just like when uh, – you know, I don't want to spoil the movie. In case anybody wants to out, go out there and see it, I do. I think you should go out and see it because it's definitely Batman drawn in a style that you've never seen before. Almost guarantee you. Go see it. It's a very interesting movie. Um, super fan, the ruffian, Little Plastic Superheroes, brought us, I think, is one of our numerous joke answers that we got this week. But uh, The Meteor Man. I don't know if that's real or not. Like, I mean, the movie was real, but is this answer real? That's what I'm really asking. Do you really want a meteor man? He probably does. I don't know. I don't know. What about Facebook? <laughs> well, real quick about meteor man. We'll see more hero clicks of meteor man than we will of ghost dad. But oh, don't. He... <laughs> well played, sir. Well played. Uh, the... Ghost dad, the official uh, movie of Dial H for hero clicks. Uh, there is one I want to kind of draw attention to, and this is from Chris Derek Rizzi, and he didn't have a written answer. He just had a picture of the new Hellboy saying, okay, and I'm pretty sure that is just one of those one-and-done movies that just got awful reviews, even though the trailer looked not terrible, but I think Hellboy is probably on the shelf for a while. Yeah, I mean, I went and saw it. I thought it was okay. I didn't think it was great, but it was okay. I enjoyed it. Uh, it was like a nice little popcorn flick. So if they made hero clicks of him, of uh, just the dead or not dead, Hellboy uh, mythos, I'd be okay with that again. Well, the, the uh, probably very cheap now. Yeah, probably. <laughs> uh, we have Citizen Kirby Ronnie 
Uh, just linked a picture of Garfield. <laughs> just Garfield. <laughs> All right. I guess he might have a lasagna-related trait. Uh, back on Facebook, uh, Justin Quinn Honeycutt says, Into the Spider-Verse, which I think that would be really easy money, and a lot of people would really go for that one. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, the last one I want to read, just because I think it's really uh, funny, it spurred me to look it up because I thought it was a joke answer. Turns out it was probably meant to be a joke answer, but it's a real thing. Um, Lynn said, Despicable Me. And I was like, no, no. Okay, so I got on to com- mycomicshop.com, and I typed in, like, Minions. So the Minions totally have their own, like, run of comics or one-offs of comics. I was like, this is a real thing. Why? <laughs> but okay, I someone may have enjoyed the Minions comic books out there, I guess. Wow, I had no idea that was a thing. It's one of those things where if a kid sees it, they're going to ask for it, so... Yeah, yeah, for sure. It would be dumb for a comic company not to make those, right? Mm, yeah. <laughs> do you have any last thing you want to cover off of Facebook? Uh, the last one I'm going to do is from Charles Garst, and he just shared a picture of Optimus Prime, giving the big thumbs up, and I honestly couldn't agree more. Okay. Uh, I. You know what? I think it would be really cool. I don't know who owns Transformers right now as far as the comic book properties. Is it IDW? I think it might be IDW. It is. But I'm, they're they're willing to work with anybody because they definitely gave the miniatures license to WizKids, but just for whatever reason, they're not part of Heroclix, and it may have something to do with board games or there might be some additional layers of licensing there, which is beyond us. What I want to know is what WizKids had to sacrifice in order to get that license because they are already – like the Transformers property is already getting made by – it's like Hasbro, right? They make the Transformer toys, and then I'm pretty sure that they make the Transformers trading card game. Uh, so why why would Hasbro even agree to turn over their property to WizKids? Are are they competing with themselves now with like little toys, or I don't understand what's going on. Hmm, but you raise an interesting point because I, I had completely forgotten about the trading card game. And even though they're not the same, I mean, one's a miniature and one's a card game, they're still collectible games. So I, I could almost see somewhere someone saying, oh, well, we can't have those competing. We need them to play our trading card game, but they can make their little toys. So if you out there in podcast land actually have a, a theory – I would love to hear it as to what you think WizKids had to – what kind of hoops they had to jump through to get that property, even if it is just to make non-painted miniatures maybe, possibly, in the future. Or just you know, some little miniatures since we're not going to get them as hero clicks. So I'd love to hear some theories out there. Uh, let's move on, though. We do have a Jedi Legends Hero Clicks tip of the week. Help you, I can. <clears throat> Take you to your destination, I will. I'm going to completely admit up front – I don't. I didn't even know this. <laughs> I did not even know this. So thank you. This is why we appreciate your Hero Clicks tips of the week, Jedi Legend. He said you can't use telekinesis for a range destroy action, but you can use it for a range object action. So no hurling dumpsters to make holes in walls. I'm afraid. I didn't even know that. I thought like there. It's intuitive that you could just, like, telekinesis a dumpster into a wall to break a wall. Why is that not a thing? Did you know that? I Until I read it just now, I realized I probably wouldn't have known that. And I feel like every week, this man shames me about what I don't know about the game. And this is just another week where I go, oh, well, uh, I need to read more, I guess. Yeah. Th- wow. God, it's just one of those things. I probably read it at one point, but then my mind just reverted back to – how I thought it used to work. Like, you used to be able to do that before the rules change, right? I'm not making that up. I don't know. It's one of those things where until you sit down and kind of, you know, look at the rules with someone and you go, well, I guess you really can't. Like, I think years, a year or two ago, we finally figured out, oh, you can't use range combat expert to show up to blow up a piece of wall because you can only use RCE against a character. And it's one of those things where until you actually try to pull it off and read the rules, you don't realize you can't do that. My gosh, some of these rules are so, they're too much, too much to remember. Man, that's going to be bad. I'm going to show up to Origins here in like a week, week and a half or whatever, 
and I'm going to sit down for my battle royales, all excited to play. I'm going to pull my pieces. I'm going to select them. Here we go. Clot time starts. Here we go. And then immediately someone's going to be like, you can't do that. And I'll be like, mm, it's not like I haven't had a podcast specifically about Heroclix for the past like two and a half years or however long I've been doing this. Well, not really not really showing a good side there. What were you going to say? You know what you do is you show up with a fake mustache and say, today's my first day of playing Heroclix. <laughs> hide, hide my name or change my name to something that no one will no one will ever ever know except some people might actually recognize me i've never had anybody recognize me by my voice but that would be really interesting you've never had anybody in a coffee shop go wait a minute do you host a hero clicks podcast no <laughs> certainly not in a random coffee shop but like uh it is weird. Okay, I, I'm not. I'm. I'm not gonna get into that. It's, I, I don't. Sounds like I'm bragging. I'm not really trying to. That sounds weird. So, um, but I feel like this happened last year in Origins where I sat down and I totally did something and someone's like, "That's illegal." Which I remember what it was. You can't use telekinesis on colossals. That's when I learned that that are more than one uh, square, like a two by two. You can't use it on that. And I was like, because this is so stupid. Jakar. Can you a two by two can use telekinesis, but he can't telekinesis someone his own size. And I was like, this is dumb. This makes no sense. And they're like, well, yeah, but that's the rules. I'm like, nope, you're absolutely right. I see that. I'm in the wrong. I admit that. But it's dumb, right? Can we at least admit that that's dumb? And they're like, well, yeah. Okay. I was like, okay, all right. we'll play by your rules, I guess. <laughs> I'm gonna do the same thing this year. I'm gonna do something stupid. And Calder's gonna be like across the room going. Don't listen to him. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He plays like once a year. <laughs> I think as long as you go to the Battle Royales and just don't wear a Dial H t-shirt. Uh-oh. I already messed up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> otherwise, you look, otherwise, you look like you know what you're talking about. So just go incognito. All right. We'll have to, we'll have to do that. But I will certainly try to remember, in case it comes up, that you cannot use a dumpster to break down a wall in the game of hero clicks um keep throwing those tips our direction jedi legend we really do appreciate that and hopefully somebody out there can utilize those wonderful tips in the future all right i think that is about it for our community this week um let's go over real quick uh we don't have any birthdays this week but if you or a loved one or someone in your shop even if you don't love them, you want to give them a shout-out on the podcast, just let us know whose birthday it is, when it is. We'll give them a shout-out on the podcast with that sexy, happy Arabian birthday. Um, as far as the Dial H Home Initiative, if this is the first time that you have tuned into Dial H, uh, you say you want to claim your territory in a venue that you, uh, that you attend in a state or a country. If it's not already been claimed, let us know what it is, and you can claim that. You can stake the flag for Dial H. You know what I just realized? I'm looking at the list in front of me. Collectible. Uh, Virginia is not claimed. Am do you want to claim Virginia right now in the name of Dial H? Can I do that on the show? I don't see why not. We can make up the rules as we go. We clearly do that anyway. But you can <laughs> claim it now. I'm, I'm going to plant my flag. I'm going to pick uh, Victory Comics in Falls Church, Virginia. And they have a excellent weekly turnout and weekend events. And they also get... Uh, WizKid Open events, so there's always HeroClix uh, activity there, and they keep a, a large selection of stuff on the shelf, so I highly recommend it. Okay, all right, Virginia claimed officially for Dial H. If you have a state you want to claim, it, I, let, let us know where it is. I know California just got claimed last week, I believe. Uh, Virginia this week. We're, we're slowly knocking down the states, and actually, just because I've been so... I've been very busy recently and haven't been able to do this. If, if anyone would be interested in making a Dial H home base initiative map, I will give you which states and where they're at. Um, I mean the names of the venues and stuff like that. And we could have a living map all laid out. And we can put it on Twitter and update it on Facebook and stuff like that. I think that would be really fun and just an additional thing uh, for the community to make us all feel, you know, like we're part. And uh, – Plus, you get bragging rights if you get to claim your state or your country. That would be pretty sweet. I think that would be interesting. So uh, that is for that is it for the Dial H Home Base Initiative. Next week is the 
heroic ceremony. So if you do jump onto our Patreon or via our PayPal, um, you want to get your heroic title, you can do that. Uh, the rules for all that is on the Patreon. And uh, if you get your heroic title and you are in there, we will send you the last bit of, uh, I think we're down to like six sets of custom Dial H for Hero Clicks dice. If you've not seen those, they are there are pictures of those on Facebook and on Twitter. You can look at those. They look sweet. We've been getting pictures from everybody that has been getting them in the mail, and we appreciate those. We think it's really cool, um, and we wish you guys the best of luck. Past that, um, I do just want to say thank you very much, Collectible, for coming on. I really appreciate you filling in Calder's extremely small clown shoes <laughs> this week. <laughs> He's like, shut up, Chris, somewhere. But thank you, seriously, for coming on. No, no, thank you for having me. Uh, one thing I do want to pass on before we sign off is a very wise man once told me Hero Clicks is a gentleman's game. Uh, so when you play, um, try to treat your opponents like it's their first time playing. So be gracious, be polite. Um, be kind if, if people make mistakes and there's no real you know prize or anything at stake if it's not a super serious game let them take them back um, if we want the game to have a future you want people to enjoy the game and you want them to come back and play again next week so just be kind absolutely thank you very much um, as always you can jump onto our facebook just search dial h for hero clicks on twitter we are at dial h for hero clicks that is the number four and if you want to send us an email we get those from time to time that's dial h for hero clicks at gmail.com and lastly but not least well at least for tonight uh dial h for hero clicks is brought to you by coolstuffinc.com and uh they are just freaking awesome i know oh, I, I forgot to say this <laughs> this this is another story. Sorry, I completely got waylaid there. <laughs> another thing that happened this week because I'm 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 so dumb, I'm so bad at this. I, I'm like the worst customer ever. So I put in another order to CoolStuffInc.com, and I forgot to change my shipping address to my new address. And I was like, Oh no! As soon as I put it in, I went to I I, I got an e I got back on the email and I sent them. And I was like. Guys, I'm so sorry again since, if you're keeping up, this is two times in like the last month that I've sent them an email about my screw-up. Uh, I was like, I'm so sorry, but my actual address is this. Is there any way you can send it to the real address instead of the address that's provided? Immediately got a response back, and they're like, yeah, no problem. We'll get that sent to wherever you want it, basically, wherever you want to get it sent to. I was like, you guys are awesome. So customer support, once again, on point from CoolStuffInc.com. Um, where you can find all of your uh, collectible miniatures, and there's going to be a bunch of stuff with the Illuminati set dropping this week. So jump on there on the cool stuff. Code Dial5 at checkout. You can uh, get 5% off of your order, and it's pretty cool. So we appreciate everything, and we will talk to you guys next episode. Bye, guys. Take care. My, 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 my style.